Welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg. I'm here joined with my colleague Lillian Corral. We are thrilled to have you for our fourth episode. How's it going, Lillian? Yeah, it started on mute, Lily. It's going well. How are you? How was the long weekend? It was good. It was good. It was a rainy day. It was actually three days of rainy days in, in Miami, but, in but Miami. All, is, all is well. Um, that's how it goes. Okay. Um, so tell us, kick us off a bit and tell us a bit about uh, Coast to Coast, what we're up to. Well, um, for hopefully folks that are have been watching us a couple a couple weeks now, um, Coast to Coast is a deep dive into cities and all of the major trends um, and issues that are bubbling up for um, city officials, urban planners, city dwellers um, around public spaces um, and life. So um, uh, we're excited to um, continually have these indiv these wonderful individuals really join us and talk about their work and tell us how they're trying to mitigate all of the crisis that's happening in the world. It's It's been really interesting and a lot of fun. Um, so today I'm, I'm really excited about our topic today and we'll be talking about how cities can better leverage streets for people. So we'll examine how streets can be a part of the solution for economic and social recovery. And we have two experts joining us. Um, they, they come from different perspectives in different fields. Um, one is thinking about the usage of streets for a downtown and its businesses. And the other is working in neighborhoods, reimagining how streets um, you know, can really be leveraged for community members. Um, it should be a really interesting conversation. Um, is there anything interesting that, that you want to learn about, Lillian? I think, um, well, I'd, I'd just be curious to see what they are going to share with us about the use of public spaces. There's a lot of conversation out there, um, especially in this last week around how do we think about them, um, the equity questions, a lot of stuff that we've discussed. Um, and then also, you know, I think what's interesting about both of these individuals is they're really creatively rethinking these spaces. And there's a lot of like um, the creativity being around play and things like that. And last week we had a lot of questions about the role of art in public spaces. So ah, I'm really, right. I'm really interested in seeing how that kind of creative spirit really can help us make these spaces okay. more livable. We'll dig into that. Um, that okay. sounds great. Um, I think it should be a lot of fun. So I am thrilled to welcome our guests. We have Shalina Odbert and Raphael Clemente. Uh, please join us. So Shalina Odpert is the co-founder and executive director of KDI Design. She is also in our inaugural uh, Knight Public Spaces Fellowship. How's it going, Shalina? Great, Lily. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Good, Good to see you. Um, and then we have Rafael Clemente, the executive director of West Palm Beach Downtown Development Authority. Um, West Palm Beach is also a night city, and Rafael has been a great friend of nights. Welcome, Rafael. Good, good afternoon and good morning to some of you. Hi, Lily. Good to see you. Good to see you. And this is truly a coast to coast episode. We have uh, Shalina, who's in LA, and we have Rafael, who's in West Palm Beach. So we are covering the entire United States. So let's Let's uh, dive right in. And I first want to tell you a bit about how this is going to work. So we have 15 minutes between you, you guys and me. Um, we will do rapid fire questions, OK? Um, and then Lillian's going to pop up and be joining and filtering up questions uh, from the audience. So audience members, please use your Q&A button for questions. Um, or you can also be joining us on Facebook Live, hashtag Night Live. We will be monitoring the questions there, too. So um, thrilled to, to begin. Um, so Shalina, I would love to start with you. And um, I would like to have you set some framing for us. Um, if you can tell us a bit from your perspective, what is the opportunity of leveraging streets for public spaces? Sure. Well, the opportunity is tremendous. And I think the way that I've been thinking about this over the last couple of months is less about reimagining the street because um, the street actually, if we look back to its origin story, uh, already holds a lot of answers for us. So I like to think about it more of remembering the street and remembering about how streets originated and what their original purpose was. And so I think we are all familiar with what streets did at the end of the 19th century. They were kind of the inverse of what they are today. Uh, pedestrians dominated the roads and cars were the rarity. Uh, they were the intruders. 
people, you know, there are great stories and, and old New York Times articles that, that talk about people, the streets being covered with people and boys running up and down the streets delivering telegrams and uh, you could even get your nails manicured on the street. Um, in, in fact, streets were kind of, the entirety of streets were these scramble crossings where people would step off the sidewalk and into the street and over to chat with someone um, at a moment's notice. And so I think, and in fact, there are plenty of places around the world where streets still function that way. And so I think the opportunity is really just to remember that origin story and take lessons from it. And in a time like the one that we're in now, uh, look to that past as, a, as an inspiration and as a, a cue for what we can do in our present. That's great. And I love that remembering our streets. And I think that's also really applicable for you, Raphael, um, as you think about um, downtown West Palm Beach. Um, what do you see as, as a, from a practitioner standpoint, the opportunity for streets, especially in the economic recovery? Well, I, I think Shalina framed it perfectly about remembering what our streets were originally designed for and the purposes that they served, um, not just as places of commerce, but of social gathering and human interaction. Um, you know, in, in West Palm Beach, we have been um, testing, probing, measuring, and carefully designing our public spaces for a long time. You know, I, I love to say that we have benefited tremendously from very good urban planning going back, you know, already uh, really to the, to the first plan uh, with John Nolan for, for our, our city um, and coming forward to uh, current day, our, our present time, we've had some of the best in the business um, help advise our city on how we can design our public spaces. Uh, and we, we've, we've, we've missed some opportunities for sure, but we've certainly capitalized on the vast majority of them. And I don't think that we could do what we're doing right now uh, in response to COVID-19 without the, uh, the great work of so many people prior to today. So, but, but tell me a bit more about, about you know, what, what you're doing. And I would love for us to flash up a picture of, um, of how you're leveraging the streets um, for yeah. businesses. So um, we all know that in, in many states, um, reopening has been allowed. In Florida, um, our governor uh, has allowed businesses to reopen, but at a reduced capacity. So much of our downtown district are locally owned um, small businesses, uh, pre predominantly on, on our ground floor, our restaurant and retail. And for these businesses to even consider survival right now, they have to find a way to um, serve customers and still abide by the, the law that's in place right now. Um, so we started working immediately with the, with the team at, in the office at the Downtown Development Authority and with city leadership to come up with a program that would allow our merchants to be able to to survive and, and it literally is a it's a life and death uh, time for them all so uh, we uh, went into action and started rolling out um, a program that became known as dining on the spot and, and what it is is um, ad just adaptively reusing public space some of its streets um, uh, our main street clematis is a recently done curbless design um, if victor dover and his team are tuned in they were very uh, instrumental in that process. Um, but this photo here is uh, on Daytura Street. It's just a traditional street with a curb and two motor vehicle lanes and on-street parking. And we worked with the businesses in that location, as well as with city leadership, uh, public safety officials to uh, get this design approved and in place uh, probably within about a week. Um, and nothing fancy, but again, in many places, this would be considered uh, undoable or even illegal. Yeah. And so, and, and my understanding is you also used, you know, temporary use um, permits. Um, we also linked in the, the chat box of an article for you to dig in deeper about, about how West Palm Beach did this, mm -hmm. um, uh, leveraging not just, not just the streets, but also um, parking lots, um, you know, um, empty, empty lots, which is just really, really interesting to be able to be that nimble and, and to be able to open up, um, to be able to, you know, 
get more space outside um, for businesses. So Shalina, I want to pivot a little bit over to you um, because you're really thinking about this at a neighborhood level. Um, and, and how do you see streets as playing a role in economic recovery? Also something we've been thinking a lot about. So I guess at the neighborhood level and particularly in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods, low income communities of color in the city of Los Angeles and really across the country, we know that moving around the city is, is causing all kinds of new hardships, particularly for those that rely on public transit or communities that really rely on these deep social networks to make things work day to day. So I see an opportunity for the street, really at the block level, to kind of become the new city. Uh, in our office, we've been calling it the five minute city. So. First, you return the street primarily to people, and it's not to exclude the car. In fact, there's this great um, story from when cars first began to um, intrude on streets. So there was a, there used to be a guy that would carry a flag down the street to let people know that the car was coming. So it's not to exclude the car permanently, but just to kind of put it back in a kind of secondary role on the street. And then once we've done that, I, then you ask the city to begin to travel to its residents. And I think that that isn't so hard for us to imagine. We already know how the ice cream truck comes to visit us at the block level. Um, some of us may be familiar with a mobile library that truck that comes to our neighborhood or a fruit vendor. And so we just tried to think about this at kind of a scaled up level. How could you reconfigure the street to be a place of service delivery? Can the Natural History Museum bring its mobile museum to your street rather than you needing to cross the city to engage in culture that way? Well, that's and what we're I looking think, at here. Shalina, oh, yeah. sorry so, to interrupt you. No problem. So this is, this is just um, a beginning uh, study on what that could look like. How do you create these little parklets or these kind of stations across the street where someone could, when uh, regulations allow, give you a haircut on the side of the road or give, do that manicure that you've been dying to have done or um, do something more cultural and, and uh, entertaining by um, pulling up the Los Angeles library a mobile van and inviting them into your community to maybe do a story hour. The options are endless. We, we began to catalog all of the things that are already mobile within the city of LA. And we have a list pages long of cultural things, basic amenities, um, and all kinds of things in between that, that really just need a place to land. And of course, the street at the block level um, can very easily accommodate that. And and then, of course, there are street vendors who really have um, provided the kind of lifeblood of amenities across our cities, le uh, in some cities legally and in some cities um, just recently go that have recently gone through the fight like Los Angeles to make street vending legal. Um, I think there's a huge untapped possibility there, and we should be enlisting their help uh, to and contracting them to help us keep our cities running at this block level. Absolutely. Some and of the things we've been thinking of. And, and where can, you said that you have a list of mobile um, services. They can, um, can folks go to your website um, for, for, for services in LA? Um, no, not yet. No. But maybe okay. that's a good place to put it. This is the okay. internal study to think oh, about it. how we can invite people onto these slow streets that we're helping the city to create. Got it. Okay. And we also, we are linking um, to um, a, a really interesting um, article that goes deeper into what KDI Design is doing. Um, and then we also just flashed up a picture of how you're thinking about also play. Um, can you just briefly tell us about how you think about play for at a street level and at a neighborhood level? Sure. Well, going back to this original idea of looking to our past and what streets how streets used to primarily function within a neighborhood. Uh, you don't even have to go back as far as to the turn of the century, uh, of the 19th century, to know that streets were used as playgrounds. I think probably many of us either played in the streets ourselves or heard stories of our parents playing in the streets. And, and so we've been um, building on that idea in the city of Los Angeles through a Play Streets program 
that's been ongoing for the past few years. And in the time of COVID, we simply began to ask ourselves, how can we adapt that Play Streets program to work in a time of social distancing? So what does touchless play look like? Um, how do we create opportunities for playful learning? Because so many kids will have been out of school for the summer and away from learning opportunities. And so we're thinking about that not just in Los Angeles, but also with the city of Philadelphia, which has a very long running Play Streets program and is really committed to continuing that throughout the summer in a way that's safe and that also has new opportunities for learning and, and cultural um, exchange during this unusual summer. Absolutely. I think all the parents are, are wondering, how do we get this to work? Touchless play. Um, we are dying to know. I know Lillian and I are, are certainly um, following this closely. So that's really interesting. Um, thanks for, for sharing. So Raphael, I, I want to pivot a little bit to you. We only have a, a couple of more minutes left um, before Lillian's going to jump in. Um, uh, you know, the stakes are really high, right, for you and, and for, for our communities across the country. Um, you know, this is a pandemic. And, and, um, and so I'm wondering, you know, what are you um, tracking and measuring during this phase of opening up um, and, and how will you remain nimble, ready to pivot um, during this process? Because it's, it's a pretty dynamic process, I would imagine. It, it is. Um, and and uh, well, we're, we're measuring right away, of course, business revenues. Are we able to make an impact with the um, effort and investment of public dollars and public space into the program? Um, what, we've, what we've done is create a grid system effectively in public space, and that could be on a street, it could be in a park or a parking lot, um, even on private property that's publicly accessible to allow these dining areas or retail spaces to, to spill out into. Um, so we're using, um, we're using public space, public life principles, really, Lily, and, and we're measuring not just how many people are using this space, but how are they using it? Um, are they lingering in the space? Um, are they assembling themselves? distance-wise in groups. Um, a big concern, very honestly, right now is are people adhering to safe distancing guidelines? So we're paying close attention to that. Um, and we're also looking to measure public perception. Do people feel safe coming back to uh, patronize and, and experience public life? Not just patronize businesses, but to experience public life in our, in our urban center. Um, because, okay. you know, the people are the lifeblood of the place. So if they're having a hesitation of returning, we need to be able to adjust to those things. Right, right. Shalina, do you want to add anything in there? I would agree with everything that Raphael said. I guess I would just maybe add um, or emphasize a point that Raphael made, which is about who's using it. Mm -hmm. I would also extend that to say, who knows about it? I think it's really important as we think about how we make these new systems available across our city, that we're doing it in a way that really makes sure that the places that need it most, the places that were already uh, lacking infrastructure and lacking access prior to the pandemic are first in line yeah. uh, or at the front of the line to receive this new infrastructure, these new opportunities for economic um, invigoration and for cultural and social opportunities, uh, as opposed to focusing them solely on the places where we know they're going to be successful because right. there was already that vibrancy and um, economic activity in the first place. So the, the fantastic point. Is really important. And that, and that really hits upon the equity lens, right? Um, you know, how do we make this equitable and inclusive? So, so I'm going to pause here. Um, we, are, we are at 16 minutes of, of chatting. So, um, so I want to call in Lillian. Um, there's a rapid fire, tons of questions coming in. Lillian, um, take it over, please. Yeah. Um, great conversation, um, Shalina and Raphael. One first question to start off with is around leadership. Um, and this actually is a question that also harkens back to one of our previous guests. Can you talk a little bit about what's the kind of leadership that needs to be in place at the city level? So maybe Shalina, you as, a, as sort of an outside of the city expert, tell us a little bit about what do you think is required in a leader? And then maybe Raphael, a, a couple of just self-reflections on what it's taken for you to be able to get this done so quickly. So um, uh, any thoughts, Shalina? I think it's pretty simple. I think from leaders, you need leaders that are ready to look outside of the traditional toolbox. 
because that's what this pandemic is calling uh, calling upon us to do across every system. So we need leaders that um, are willing to take calculated risks and willing to move things in ways that they haven't been moved before so that we can um, take a chance, see what works. If it doesn't work, move, pivot immediately and get to things that can be functional over the next two, three, six months uh, as quickly as possible because that's what our city needs. We won't get everything right, right away, but if we don't move quickly to and with the best information that we have to put things out into the public, um, we may miss the window to really uh, have an impact at all. That's a great point. Raphael, um, any thoughts about sort of what it's taken for you to get this work moving? Uh, well, as, as I mentioned earlier, when we started the session, um, that this has been an incremental building up of willingness and, and learning um, at the leadership level at the very top from our, our mayor and commission on down to my board of directors at the DDA, but also in our community. Um, and we've done a lot of hard work to be sure that the leaders in our community, whether they're our elected officials or our influencers in our, in our community residents and business owners, um, have the information and the understanding of what works and what doesn't work. And that, you, and that we've been able to bring them into the process um, from the start. Uh, I think that you know, engaging the leadership in that way and involving them, and giving them the assurance that this is you know, whatever we're doing, we're going to be doing in the best way possible. We're gonna be monitoring and measuring uh, and uh, carefully approaching it. Giving them the confidence to make that decision has been the key uh, for us to get it done. Great. Um, there's another set of questions that's really come up around how do we make sure that there's the right set of balance. Um, there's a there's a, a gentleman, Alan, on the line who really talked about, you know, we cars bring customers to these areas. Um, we need to be able to deliver and run business. So can you talk a little bit about how we strike the right balance? And then also maybe some specific criteria. A couple of folks asked, are there specific criteria that you're seeing used to develop which streets are slow? What does this really look like? Because I think folks are wondering, do we just stop all cars or all movement? Like, what, 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 what are some real examples of how this is really rolling out? Either of you. Yeah, I'll just say a couple of quick things. And that's why I brought up the uh, man with the flag back in 1908, because there were really good systems even back then to ensure that cars could access these same streets for all the things that the person who raised the question pointed out. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's not about eliminating the cars. It's just about thinking about our streets more as a network and thinking about how a network of streets serves both pedestrians and other modes of travel and vehicles so that you arrive at this balance that allows both types of um, service and uh, opportunity to, to coexist. Um, and I'm sure Raphael has some great examples, so I'll stop there for now. Yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, um, and uh, I'll, give, I'll just give a concrete example um, from our most recent efforts in West Palm. Um, our, our main street, Clematis, was just recently redone. Uh, and through the design process with Dover Cole and local stakeholders and city officials, um, one thing that we realized through measuring uh, was that the amount of space allocated to cars versus people was completely lopsided. It was, it was backwards. The number of human beings out of their cars using the street uh, was was significantly more than the number of vehicles using the street, especially at peak hour times. But the amount of space of that of that main street corridor, the that the majority of it was dedicated to motor vehicle movement and storage, parking spaces and travel lanes. Mm -hmm. So what we what we did was rebalance the street, was balance the street in an appropriate way. The initial response was, how are we going to park? How are we going to do deliveries, et cetera? But as we've seen the various phases, the blocks of the streetscape project. Uh, come to reality. We're now having people asking for more. In fact, the latest, ver the latest phase of the project, the vast majority of the stakeholders in those blocks said, you know what, get rid of all the parking, just leave a pickup and drop off area and a delivery space and let us have more, more room for human beings to spill out into the public realm. So as Chalina said, yes, it's a balance, 
but there is also this cognitive process of getting our heads around the fact that that creating more space for people doesn't mean eliminating cars it means rebalancing our public spaces especially in our urban centers that's a great example about the pickup and drop off space because there were a couple of questions about what do we do with gig drivers what do we do with deliveries or curb management and it seems like you could just rethink the space you can assign it and then create some of that balance you're talking about there was a good question here around ADA and accessibility. Um, can you both talk about how you're thinking about accessibility in your work? Um, because, yeah, I mean, I think we're assuming, I know I live in Los Angeles and one of the big issues we have is our sidewalks are destroyed by a lot of street trees. And so we've had a lot of issues with ADA compliance and being able to really navigate the street. Can you talk about how you're dealing with that issue um, and how you ensure that it is it's truly accessible? Yeah, I, I would just say uh, one, the thing that we are doing in our office is approaching it like we would any design process, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's temporary and even though it has to be quick. Um, I think, I guess I, we would say that temporary and quick doesn't mean that it can, it just needs to be kind of the lowest common denominator. It still needs to work for everyone. It still needs to be inclusive for everyone. And so whether we're talking if we're talking about something as simple as touchless play, that's touchless play that works for people of all abilities, of all ages, and, and of all um, types. And, and so I, it's simply for me, the, the answer to that question is about process. The way that we bring all of these things online, whether they be a programmatic intervention or a physical intervention, it really needs to start with inclusion and equity at the heart of it. And um, if it doesn't, if we try to push those things aside in the uh, name of uh, urgency or expediency, then we are missing the real uh, question and the real challenge that is before us. It is to do these things for everyone um, in a way that is equitable and that includes people of all types and abilities. Yeah, yeah I, I'll just add that, you know, uh, yes, the, the process, um, as Shalina pointed out, is is you know that's the very beginning. That's where that you plant the seed and grow and grow your project. Um, in terms of keeping things going, uh, urban place management and and um, uh, quality public realm uh, outcomes are all about continuously monitoring and repairing and fixing and measuring and reevaluating your place um, and access is you know at the very top of the list access for all you know an equitable access program is a is a critical element um, for everyone uh, so whether it's a permanent hardscape project uh, like a streetscape or whether it's a a responsive adaptive program like dining on the spot we're always looking at um, at access and through the permitting process you know obviously with our city those things are always looked at and then we monitor to make sure that they stay in place Great. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Lily to close it out. There's some great questions around how does zoning change after this? What do we think about smart infrastructure? Um, but maybe we can um, tackle those offline. And uh, Lily, you want to um, hop on and, yeah. and wrap us up? That, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Lillian. Um, thank you, Raphael. Shalina, that was fantastic. There are tons of questions. Um, so we are going to be flashing up um, your uh, Twitter handles. Um, so if you want to continue the conversation, um, please, please do continue. Um, I also saw a lot of questions around um, uh, uh, touchless play, uh, Shalina, and if that's a real thing, and it, it is a real thing. It is. Um, <laughs> so, so it's really, really exciting. Um, We'll be seeing and, it on the streets of Philadelphia in just a few months. Ah, yes. Wow. Um, and we, we heard from Catherine last week about that. Um, so thank you both um, again for, for joining us for this, for this quick episode on how we can leverage streets um, within our communities. I really heard a lot about engagement, inclusivity, equity as being a, at the heart of it. So thank you so much for, for taking the time. Um, Lillian, can you tell us a bit about what we're going to be discussing um, next week? Yeah, so we're going to start to talk a little bit more about the role of technology. So the last question around smart infrastructure um, is a really good one. And we're inviting Anthony Townsend, who is the author of Smart Cities, which was a book that came out in 2013. And it has a new book coming out called Ghost Road. And so as you know, Lily, transportation mobility has been highly impacted by 
this um, pandemic. And so one of the things that he's really going to be talking to us is there's both positives and negatives, obviously, to these autonomous vehicles and the autonomous future. And Anthony's going to help us dissect all that. And so we hope everybody can join us next week for that conversation. Same place, same time. Tuesdays, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, um, and look forward to seeing everyone on Coast to Coast next week. Take See care. you next week. Bye. Take care.